All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for Gary, for him teaching your word to us. God, we pray today that you fill him with the Holy Spirit, that he pricks our hearts and changes our lives. God, we pray that we live our lives for you and that you get the glory. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> thank you, brother. <clears throat> Morning, church. It is good to be back after a uh, week of COVID. Um, not going to say who gave that to me, but Rhonda did. <laughs> um, yeah, it's uh, always interesting to call the elders, and I did not have COVID at the time, and I said, look, Rhonda has it, I'm around her, but I can still come preach if y'all want me to. They said, no, don't. <laughs> Uh, which was good because a couple of days later I tested positive. And so thanks to one of our elders, Todd Walker, for filling in the pulpit last week. Thank you to another one of our elders, David Lehman, for teaching the adult Bible class in my stead. Um, did y'all notice it took two elders to fill in for me? I don't know. I'm just, just saying. I uh, don't know if y'all caught that, but uh, no, <laughs> nevertheless, I appreciate them uh, doing that and... Um, being able to, to run with a sermon. I always tell our elders, have you a back pocket sermon that you can preach at any time just to get up and preach? In fact, it shouldn't just be the elders, but guys, every one of you should have that back pocket sermon. You ever go somewhere and they need a preacher, you got something you can jump up there and preach, right? Yes. All the women are saying, yeah. The guys are like, whoa, uh-uh. So... Let me mention a couple of things. Next week, um, Easter sunrise service on the beach. Uh, we had some handouts in the back, show where that is. I didn't see any earlier, so we might need to, uh, need, need, need to print some of those out. Hold on, let me make an adjustment. I, I don't want to... Uh, have my iPad ringing while the service is going on. I apologize for this. But anyway, uh, as far as the Easter sunrise service goes, uh, it'll, it'll be behind Silver Shell's condominiums, uh, where it was last year. For any of you that know uh, where that was, if not, you can always get with us. We could, um, I don't have any maps on me now, but we could always email that to you during this week if you would like. So, next Sunday, 6 o'clock, right? 6 o'clock, 6 a.m. Yeah, and uh, sunrise is, uh, I believe, 616. So, it'll still be light out there. Last year was absolutely amazing. Uh, the sunrise coming up over the beach. We live in a beautiful place here. Dolphins out there playing around. It was a beautiful sight last year. Hoping for the same. However, if in fact there is inclement weather, uh, we will have the service here, okay? So some of you are wondering that, right? So how will you know if it's bad enough to have it there or not? Well, if I'm not there, figure I'm here. Um, but nevertheless, you know, we can get the word out if you'd like, but, uh, we will plan on being down there, start at 6 a.m. And then we'll have, uh, our, um, bad weather. We'll have it here, but we'll have it down there at six, eight o'clock. We're having breakfast here. So there's a sign up sheet in the back. Uh, love for you to sign up to bring something if you'd like. But nevertheless, just come and enjoy breakfast with us at 8. And then our worship service at 9. Yes, that was a question. Are we still going to have church at 9? Yes, we will. You will have gotten up really early. We will have fed you a big breakfast. And you will sleep through next week's sermon. More than likely. Uh, but we will have our lesson at 9 and Bible class at 10.30. So that's all planned for next week. But the big thing here to remember is sign up. Uh, to bring food for next week. I think that's all my announcements that I have for us. We ha we're going to begin this morning with a video. Vaughn, you got our video ready for us?
prayed, no, it wasn't the nails that held Jesus on a cross. Uh, never was the nails. It was, it, was, it was His love. It was His passion for all of us, for all of humanity, loving us so much. I could get up here every week, every Sunday, and preach a sermon about Jesus' love. And I sometimes wonder as I do that, are we so accustomed to it that it, maybe it doesn't mean as much to us when we talk about that? You know, what does the love of Christ actually mean to you? Do you really embrace what that is all about? Do you really understand it? Have we gotten so accustomed to talking about Jesus loves me that it doesn't impact us any longer? I have mentioned before loving to listen to people's conversion stories. I love to listen to how they came to know the Lord. I love to listen to those because, you know, I don't have one. I've been in church since I was a baby. I was raised up, and there's nothing wrong with that. Don't you walk out here saying, preacher says, it's not good to raise your kids up in the Lord. You say that, you are lying. You're going to hell. <laughs> Fry like a Jimmy Dean sausage. I had to say it. Nevertheless... I have been with people and listened to their conversion stories and they start talking about how they came to the Lord and I have witnessed them, I have seen them just start boo-hooing, tears in their eyes. I don't have that conversion story. I was raised up knowing God loved me. I was raised up knowing Jesus loves me and loved me so much He died for my sins. But I sometimes wonder if maybe we say it so much, we've gotten accustomed to it. And I tell you what, we should never get accustomed to just understanding, how should I put this without messing it totally up? I don't want to get accustomed to the love of Jesus so much that I don't think anything of it. That, I, that I'm not continually amazed that someone could love me, could love us so much that they would come and willingly go to, to a cross to die for me, to die for us. I don't want to get accustomed to that thought. I want to be absolutely amazed every time I think about it. And one of the things that I've learned in my life, you know, I know Jesus loves me. I know the song, Jesus Loves Me. I've been taught that all of my life. You know, I, I, I want to experience it new and fresh every day. I don't want it to grow old in my life. One thing I've realized about love is how it changes for me. You know, I grew up loving my parents and my siblings, my relatives, my friends, and different ones like that. I fell in love with a young lady and married her back in 1986 and love her to this day. But I tell you what, there's, there's something else. It's when children come along that there's a different type of love. It's, it's just different. It, Gary's way of thinking. You can disagree with me if you want. You'll be wrong, but you can disagree. It's just different. Would I die for my children? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I would die for my wife. I would die for other people, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I was in the military, right? And you figure, well, isn't that what you signed up for? You're supposed to die. Well, not supposed to, but might. But as I love my children, I often think of the love that Jesus has for me in that type of love in sending His Son, His only Son, to come to this world to live and to die, but to be resurrected again. We're going to look a little bit more at that this morning. And I tell you what, church, I want you to be amazed. I want you to be amazed at the love of Jesus. That's what I want. 
Jesus' actions in coming to this world were fueled by a very humble love. And as we're going to look today, a perfect humble love focused in on the joy set before him. Yeah. But as I began, let me tell you, as I was in the Air Force for 30-something years, one thing about the Air Force is the Air Force loves to run. I mean, we test, we do PT tests, physical training tests, uh, once or twice a year, depending on how you're doing one of them, you might can skip and go to the next year, uh, whatever it is, but the Air Force loves to run. Sometimes we just get together and let's say, hey, let's have a fun run. <gasps> yeah, a fun run. That's what I want to do. And we did, and we ran a lot. Um, I, throughout the year, was practicing for my test, my PT test. I hated that. I hated that. When I retired from the Air Force, I said, I ain't got to run anymore unless something's chasing me. And by the end of my first year of retirement, my goal is to weigh 450 pounds. <laughs> I was well on my way until Rhonda said, time out. <laughs> I did, you know, I mean, I did enjoy running to a certain degree. One of the, the greatest joys I had running was even in my 50s in the Air Force, I was beating 20-something-year-old young men in the run. <laughs> yeah, my last run, I was coming around on the last lap, and I was about a quarter of the way through, and as I was going, I could hear the footsteps, and some young guy thought he was going to beat me. I said, Lord, I might die. I might die. Because I don't know how much my lungs can hold, but this young man will not beat me to that finish line. And he did not. <laughs> yes, we love to run. Running was a big thing. I have the flat feet and the bad knees now to prove how much the Air Force loved to run. My last few years, I was running around four miles a day, five to six days a week. Now to someone like our very own Valeria, um, who just loves to run, for whatever reason, bless her heart, uh, you know, oh great, we got a 10K, yay! Wait, wait, no, we're doing a double marathon, woo! She loves to run. I'm not like that. I'm not like that. Running was a big thing. And, and, and yeah, we did do sometimes... Uh, 5Ks. This is my son and or my son, my grandson, Logan. Logan was three at the time. This is 2016. We had just finished a 5K, he and I, and uh, well, it was a, I think that one was a color run, even though I don't have much color on me up there. Um, but he went with me and we ran this and there was a lot of us and we got off and I was, you know, around the front of the pack and then I'm pushing him and we start backing off a little bit and he's yelling at me, Poppy, they're passing us, catch up, catch up, Poppy. I, I'm pushing you. Poppy, here they come, here they come. I think you can, Poppy. I love him, but I wasn't going any faster. And we did not finish last, I'll tell you that too. Let me tell you, running is mentioned, as you know, several times in the Bible. In running terms, Jesus ran an absolutely perfect race here on earth. And his race took him to his eventual death on a cross. And today we hope to learn more about the perfect love that fueled Jesus on his journey. So today we're going to start off, you have your Bible, I have it up on the screen as well, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, where the Apostle Paul has some profound things to say, because the Apostle Paul, apparently he enjoyed running as, as well, I don't know, but uh, reading uh, things that he has written, it, it, would, it would appear that way. So 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 26, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last 
forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. Jesus did, as I said before, ran a perfect race. And we know from the Gospels that he was very disciplined with his time. He was intentional. He, he, he wasn't running aimlessly or boxing in the air. He had an eternal crown in mind. He had a special mission and a special calling. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, Let us run with perseverance. The race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. We're called to run a similar race while running through life. It's important that, that, we, that we do so with perseverance. Some of, some of your translations might say endurance. Endurance requires commitment to the cause, invites us to never give up hope on crossing that finish line. Endurance, perseverance. But today I want us to talk a little bit about Jesus as the perfecter of our faith while we actually run the race. God is able to, to, to refine us as we run this race with endurance. And we might say, well, how does that happen? You know, what's required from us in order to experience this? What do we need to do to experience God? We already spent a little time in a series discussing how Jesus suffered on the cross for our sins. We talked about His passion for humanity. And I believe that if we desire to experience that same passion, if we desire to experience Christ... If we desire to experience Him personally, day by day. Okay, let me pause there. Church, I 100% believe that if you don't have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you have no relationship with Him at all. Okay? You might say, well, preacher, why are you telling us that? Well, this, I think it was this past week where I was reading that there's a lot of discussion, and a lot of people don't believe that we can have a personal relationship. People within our own fellowship, not something we talk about a whole lot. How is your personal relationship with Christ? If we desire to experience that type of relationship with Jesus Christ, we need to be willing to fix our gaze upon the cross. As humans, as humans, we experience this ongoing conflict between where we fix our gaze versus where we glance. For many here today, you know, maybe you're feeling empty. I don't know where you are in your relationship with Jesus. I don't know if you're full right now or if you're half full or you know what? Maybe you're about empty. Maybe you felt as if you don't have much to give. And today you are here out of obligation because, well, this is where you go on Sundays. You go to worship. Maybe it's because you're glancing at God while gazing at the world. Church, let me tell you, I, I want to encourage you to make a switch today it is so easy to get caught up in life and get and to start gazing at life and every now and then take a glance at God it's easy to do that I want to invite you to spend time gazing at God and beholding Him, maybe in a whole new way. 
Gazing at God invites us to spend time with Him constantly. You know, Paul talks about this in his, in his, in his letter to the uh, Thessalonians. Pray continually, right? Or pray without ceasing, as most of us were raised up on uh, remembering that verse. Pray continually. Pray without ceasing. What does that mean? Closing your eyes and talking to God, right? Well, maybe so. Having that prayerful attitude all the time. Fixing our gaze upon Christ. You know, I think that means praying while we're in the car. No, not shutting your eyes, please. But praying while we're in the car, praying while we're in a coffee shop, praying while we're in the grocery store, praying while we're at work, praying when we drop kids off at school, praying when we're praying everywhere, having that prayerful attitude all the time. Having that prayerful attitude, having that conversation with God. Having that type of relationship. And you know, I think sometimes we need to train our minds to focus on Christ. And to stop focusing in on all the other things that occupy our time. Gazing at, gazing at Jesus. Glancing at the world. I, I think there's, there's no limit to the amount of time we can spend with God in numerous different ways. All the time we spend with God is meant to direct our focus back to the cross. It's where our, our, our hope lies in any and every season of our lives while running this race. This race. And as, as we direct our focus to the cross, God's able to refine and perfect our faith. He's able to take us deeper in prayer, deeper in His Word. However, allowing God to perfect our faith, well, it doesn't just include, I, I don't believe, gazing at the cross. The Bible makes it clear there'll be hard times that we face while running this race, right? We know that. Life is difficult. We'll have to learn how to endure frustration. We'll have to learn how to endure pain. We'll have to learn how to endure hardship. All those things are going to happen. Well, preacher, that's sad. Don't tell us that. You know, I, I don't want to lie to you today. Life can get difficult. And if you're of the faith, and if you're of the belief that you'll be a Christian as long as things are good, and then something bad happens... You'll have no more faith in God. Why, we can see in John 16, 33, Jesus tells us, in this, wor in this world, you're going to have trouble. Right there, in black and white, or really red in your Bibles, you're going to have trouble. Jesus tells us that. And then in James... Chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you, have, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the test in your faith produces perseverance. Okay, <laughs> back up, preacher. James 1, verses 2 and 3. He said, consider, consider it pure joy. So, when you're going through these trials and you're upset, don't you come to me because I'm going to tell you, don't. you got to be joyful. You know, probably not exactly what that means here. The implication is, look, you're going to have trouble, but also be joyful because the testing of your faith here will produce perseverance. There's some good that's going to come out of this. So when we go through hard times, that does not mean, oh, I've got to walk around being joyful and happy. No, no, there's going to be hard times. There's going to be hurt. There's going to be tears and all like that. But what's going to come out of this is the test of your faith will produce that perseverance. It'll produce 
that endurance. So as bad as times get, test into your faith. Be joyful about that because it will produce perseverance. These are just a couple of passages here that reiterate a consistent message that you're going to find throughout the Bible. Because you've got to remember, even Jesus had to endure, endure trouble, persecution, pain, suffering. He, he endured all those things. We remember the anguish Jesus felt just before being arrested. Remember that? He prayed and he said, Lord, let this cup pass from me. I've prayed similar prayers myself. However, he was ultimately willing to endure the cross. As Hebrews says, for the joy set before him. I'm going to go through this for the joy set before me. I'm going to enjoy, you know, getting ready to take a PT test in the Air Force. I mean, it was like, you could ask Rhonda what I would go through in the week or so preceding that, just getting ready. But don't ask her because some of it's not good. <laughs> and I, I mean, basically, I would, I would stop eating pretty much. I mean, it was, it was like I would become, uh, I mean, I would stop drinking water. I would, you know, it was, it was bad. And I wasn't the only one. There's a lot of folks in the Air Force that did this. Probably some of it was I should have started way beforehand getting ready for the PT test, which was more than just a run. It was push-ups, set-ups, a run, and, and they measured your waist. And I got really good at sucking in a waist. I am a national champion. But I remembered the joy set before me because when it was done and I had my score sheet and I had passed, I got the biggest, juiciest cheeseburger you ever saw in your life and I was joyful eating that getting thinking about the next six months or a year where I'm gonna have to take this thing again and you know I retired I retired 2020 right as COVID was going on and you know I could have stayed in because they did away with the PT test for a couple of years there I just thought of that <laughs> <laughs> For the joy set before him. That's what our Lord and Savior was thinking about. The joy set before him. For the sake of you and me experiencing new life. That was his joy. If we want our faith to be refined and perfected, chances are we'll have to go through the fire. And, and, and here, here's what Paul says elsewhere. In Romans 8, 17, now if we're children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. You know, there can be, there can be something beautiful about seasons of suffering in our life. Listen to me on that. There can be something beautiful about seasons of suffering in our lives. We, we don't like to suffer. In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, down in verses 10 and 12, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad. Isn't it funny how he just kind of rolls around that? Look, people calling you names. They're they saying you're this, they're saying you're that. They're, they're, they're false witnesses. They're doing all these mean, these ugly, outrageous things against you. But rejoice and be glad. <laughs> well, Jesus, you know, that, that can be difficult. And I, I'm sure he realizes, I'm sure he realizes that. But he said, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. 
You know, when, when we feel like we're at the most difficult points in our lives, it's often the time that, that God's able to shine His light the brightest. You know, possibly, maybe God has you in a season that you're in right now so that He can shape and mold you into the person He wants you to be. You know, it may not feel comfortable. However, the Bible promises us that we can still have joy in the midst of all the suffering. The decision that Jesus made to endure the To endure the cross was, in the eyes of the world, foolish. Culturally, it was a death tool that illustrated shame. Remember, I mean, he went to a cross. He went to a cross. Now, the way someone's put to death makes a difference. He he was put to death on a cross that the punishment here, the capital punishment, was how criminals were punished. Some of you might remember when Saddam Hussein was put to death. I remember that. I was in Iraq at the time uh, in in December of 2006. And I also remember how he didn't want to be hung because that was for like a common criminal. He wanted to be executed by firing squad for someone of his stature. Jesus was put to death on a cross that at that time was was a punishment set aside for criminals. Thus, who did he have on both sides of him? Thieves. And yet, he was willing to die that way for the joy set before him. So you might say, preacher, are you saying that Jesus was joyful in, in, in reconciling sinners like us to God? Yes, he was. Absolutely he was. Church, let me ask you this. Does it bring you joy to think about those in your life that don't know Christ and then they come to faith in him? What if God is trying to see, to use you to plant the gospel seeds? Even through sharing Christ, talking to people about the Lord, planting those seeds, He will perfect your faith. Keep your eyes fixed on the cross. Endure whatever the race brings. Remember, you're not alone in this race. All throughout Jesus' earthly ministry, He reminded people he was not alone. God the Father was directing his steps. He knew he wasn't alone. God was with him. Jesus was finding moments, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, that he spent one-on-one time with the Father. He models for us what it means to be fully reliant on God's strength and God's plans. And then this is where the Holy Spirit comes in, when we realize what it means that we're never alone, we're willing to allow God to lead us through difficult times. I bet, I bet we could all remember difficult times in our lives where God has led us through. I bet we could get up this morning and testify about times where we felt God's presence with us even more than normal. Walking with us. Walking with us every step of the way. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. God says He'll walk with us through the valley. He doesn't say, take heart, I'll meet you on the other side. He walks through those valleys. You know, I've witnessed Jesus perfecting and refining my faith. It happens when we're solely reliant on God's ability and willingness to lead us through life. We need to learn to trust Him, to have faith, learn to rely on the power, learn to, listen to this, learn to rely on the Holy Spirit within us. John 14, 16 and 17, I will ask the Father, 
And He will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. Jesus Himself says the Holy Spirit will never leave us. Whether we're enduring tough times right now in life, or maybe our lives are, 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 are we're on the top of the world, we're producing much fruit, giving glory to God for His faithfulness. Whatever the case might be, you know what? We're never alone in this journey. The perfect love of Christ for His church, it's an absolutely amazing gift. And it's worth remembering that Christ learned perfect love. He received perfect love from His heavenly Father. I brought this up before and it's worth remembering here. Jesus reminds us, John 15, 9, As the Father loves me, so I also love you. Remain in my love. Remain in my... Does that mean we could walk out of Christ's love? I think, I think Christ will continue to love us. But I also believe we can turn our backs on Christ. Jesus, the Savior of mankind, is asking you to remain in His love. Don't go looking for it anywhere else. Stay, remain, be a part of it. As many of us here know all too well, you're not going to find the unconditional, all-powerful love of Christ from some counterfeit God or vocation or hobby or worldly relationship. But if you've been looking for perfect love everywhere else but Christ, church, let me, let me invite you to Him today. I, as I said earlier, I don't know where you are in your spiritual walk. You might be so full of the Lord that you're about to burst, and that's absolutely wonderful and amazing. But, but, but maybe you're running on empty. Maybe life is difficult right now. I encourage you on that. If that's where you are, maybe... You know, God's in the same place He's always been. We're the ones who walk away. If where you are right now is not where you should be or where you want to be and you need to come to the Lord, I encourage you to do that today. If you need to become a Christian, I encourage you to do that today. You know, but sometimes things are more difficult than just coming forward. If you're at a place in your life and you just need to talk, you know what? I'm here for you if you need to talk. If we need to sit down and discuss some things in your life. If you're not where you need to be spiritually or something else that's going on, you know what? I'm ready to talk. If you are. Our elders are as, as well. If there's something that you need in your life, if you are not where you are supposed to be, if you don't have, if you don't have that awesome feeling within you, you know what? When, when you're thinking about the love of Jesus and, 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 and Him going to a cross and dying for us and just being absolutely amazed and even perplexed at the love of Jesus, you know, we need to change our gaze a little bit. Let's don't glance at church. Let's gaze at the Lord. Gaze. Fix our gaze upon Him. Church, this morning, if you're subject to the Lord's invitation, if there's something you need in your life, if there's some way that we can help you, you know what? We want you whole. We want your gaze on Jesus. If there's some way that we can help you this morning, we invite you to come right now while together we stand and while we sing.